Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jessica Berman. I'm director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities at UMBC and professor of English. Um, and we're really delighted to be with you this afternoon virtually. Um, today's lecture is part of our Fall 2023 Humanities Forum, which is a free public lecture series, uh, both virtually and on campus. Our next event will take place on Wednesday, November 8th at 6 p.m. in the University Center Ballroom on the UMBC campus. And I just want to take a, a quick minute to tell you about it. It's the 45th annual W.E.B. Du Bois lecture from the Department of Africana Studies at UMBC. And it will present Moses Ochono, Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair of History and Professor of African History at Vanderbilt University. He will speak about eight phases of African American reinvention. Um, and in this talk, he'll use uh, Congolese philosopher V.Y. Mudumbe's concept of the invention of Africa as a point of departure to explore the ways in which African Americans from the mid 19th century to the present invented and reinvented ideas, semiotics, and tropes of Africa to respond to evolving circumstances, challenges, and aspirations in America and beyond. Uh, to learn more, I encourage you to look at the Dresher Center website, dressercenter.umbc.edu, and you can also connect with us on social media. Um, I hope you'll plan to attend that really wonderful sounding event. Um, before we begin this lecture, um, I want to make just one, a couple of announcements. First, I want to acknowledge that UMBC was established upon the land of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. We humbly offer our respects to all past, present, and future indigenous people connected to this place. And while we recognize the importance of acknowledging those who came before us, we also know that this is only a small gesture and we must take action towards the necessary work of repair. Next, this afternoon's event is being live streamed and will be made available on the UMBC YouTube page shortly after the event. And I also wanna thank the Department of History, the Department of Sociology, Anthropology and Public Health and the Office of Accessibility and Disability Services for co-sponsoring this event. Q&A will take place directly after the talk. Questions can be submitted at any time into the Q&A chat box. To enable the Q&A box, please click on the three dots at the bottom right corner of the screen and select Q&A. Um, we also have live captioning during this event and you can visit guidedog.intellitext.us and place the new window adjacent to the WebEx window for simultaneous viewing. You should have that address in the chat and also it's available to you on screen right now. The link, um, a special thanks to the IntelliText, to IntelliText for providing their live captioning services this semester and helping us to make the Humanities Forum more accessible. Finally, please join me in welcoming Tanya Lizarazzo, Associate Professor in the Department of Modern Languages, Linguistics, and, uh, and Intercultural Communication and the Global Studies Program, who will introduce our speaker. Tanya. Thank you, Jessica. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, and especially to our guest, Aparna Nair. Aparna Nair is a historian of disability, public health, and medicine. From 2015 to the end of 2022, she worked as an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma Norman in the History of Science Department. Her upcoming book, Fungible, Fungible Bodies, with the University of Illinois Press Disability Stories, examines the relationship between disability and colonialism in British India. Professor Nair also works on the histories of technologies for disabled people, vision aids, hearing aids, prosthetics, etc the histories of vaccination and quarantine in India, the material histories of vaccination, specifically the history of the vaccination certificate, and also work on the changing representations of disability and difference in popular culture. 
She also has lived with epilepsy for more than 30 years, and part of her work also explores what it means to live with epilepsy in South Asia and issues around passing gender identity and belonging. Nair currently teaches at the University of Toronto's Scareborough in the Department for Health and Society and the Center for Global Disability Studies. Welcome, Aparna. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and um, thank you to um, the Humanities Center for this uh, generous introduction um, so that I can come and share my work with you. And thank you for taking the time to be here, everyone. So I'm going to see if I can manage to share my screen. I have shut down the 75 win um, windows that I had up. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, I will um, start uh, by um, kind of situating this particular paper um, and this lecture. Um, dogs and humans have a very, very long interconnected history from the moment of the uh, of the domestication. Historians and archaeologists have documented the uh, multitudinous roles that dogs have played in human society. They um, are our companions, our guardians. Um, they are the receptacles of our um, emotions and violence. Um, and, you know, in some, they are food, they are um, part of our responses to health and disability as well, but also implicit. Uh, within, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, but they're also implicated within broader histories of colonialism and violence. Um, and whatever we feel about dogs, it's unquestionable that they have worked their way into the crevices of our everyday lives and our imagination in ways that we could barely imagine. Um, and there's such a rich history of scholarship on this particular to topic. Um, the um, handsome fellow you see on the screen here is actually the inspiration for my work on um, disability and dogs. Um, in uh, 2017, I started having um, seizures again, and Charlie, my seizure, uh, was my rescue dog, and um, he started sensing my seizures before they happened, and. I've never experienced that before. And it really, um, you know, I fell down a rabbit hole uh, as you do. Um, um, and I've been interested in what the relationship is between disabled people and dogs and more ab on an abstract level between disability and animality in general. Um, and the uh, topic of this uh, uh, talk is of course, as you know, the guide dog. Today it is a, um, at least in uh, much of uh, Northern Euro America and parts of Western Europe, it is a legitimate um, and legally protected um, sentient technological uh, adaptation to disability. Um, th this figure has been studied extensively by historians of um, of animals and of this um, and disability studies scholars who have um, explored um, the. Um, interdependence between the two species and what that can mean, uh, both in public and private spaces. Um, uh, in its modern form, however, the guide dog is only a century old and accurate estimates of the numbers of guide dogs are kind of hard to come by. But we know that there are at least around maybe 100,000 in the US. They're quite expensive to come by, um, trained guide dogs. Um, so maybe only about 2% of Blind um, uh, Americans actually have um, a, a, a guide dog. But what fascinates me is how the guide dog has nonetheless become this visual shorthand for blindness, um, part of the cultural leitmotif of blindness. Um, and this, um, this particular research started um, uh, in 2019 when I had realized that uh, the guide dog had become a part of the emoji pa uh, uh, pack, um, the updates. Uh, to the email emoji pack 12.0, uh, uh, um, there were a series of disability related motifs, wheelchairs, um, white canes, um, hearing aids, sign language, but there were several um, iterations of the guide dog as well. And I was uh, fascinated by how this um, 
this the guide dog has become a cultural symbol of blindness um and it's also traveled even to spaces where you don't find guide dogs um for instance india where um you st- um you th- in 2023 there was a movie out on uh a uh, hindi movie out on uh disab- on a blind woman who had a guide dog um and we still don't have many guide dogs in india so the um what i try to do in this paper is to explore exactly how this happened and i draw on scholarship from both um critical disability studies and disability um so, uh, and animal studies um and i uh, uh attempt to use um ideas from the cultural model of disability to explore how representations of the guide dog team uh, of this dyad, this interdependent dyad of the guide dog and the blind handler. Um, um, and I focus uh, uh, primarily on the period after the decades after the Second World War um, and uh, uh, try to explore how different media have uh, have depicted this relationship and the intentions of such representations to challenge pre-existing ideas of dogs and disability and what it means uh, um, you know um, and what it had would have meant for uh, blind people and uh, uh, their uh, guide dogs now um in uh, as a historian i am uh, obligated to kind of uh, contextualize this um the relationship between dogs and blind people um seems to be uh, cautiously uh, we can say that it, it seems to be much older than the 19th of the 20th century um for instance several medieval historians have pointed out that um dogs are often um uh, a visual signifier for blindness in uh, medieval uh, European marginalia, uh, um, and um, as you can see on the slide here, it shows um, examples of um, medieval marginalia showing uh, blind people, uh, uh, blind figures with their eyes um, closed or um, clouded, uh, carrying canes and um, uh, holding on to the le- uh, leashes of small dogs in general. Um, you know, this the, this um, uh, vis- artistic rep- rep- um, trope continues into the centuries, uh, whether we're talking about the dance of death um, or um, early modern re- depictions of blind people in public spaces. The dog held on a leash going ahead of the blind person was often, you know, in the same way that the stick came to represent um, infirmity and blindness. Um, so did the little dog. Um, and you see, um, uh, in the 19th, uh, 18th and 19th centuries as well, this continues, uh, uh, these, uh, um, these artistic representations of, um, blind, uh, so, uh, veterans, for instance, holding on to, um, the leashes of dogs who had bowls, begging bowls in their mouths as they, uh, uh, played music or performed or begged on the streets. Um, so there's this, uh, there's a growing connection, uh, between the blind person's dog in public spaces and art, at least, um, as an aspect of, uh, the, of poverty, dependency and vagrancy. That was typically how, um, um, I mean, the, the, the impression that many of these, are, uh, um, sorry, um, that is typically the um, uh, way that these uh, artistic representations are analyzed. But I'm a social historian, so I look for uh, um, sources in, in addition to um, uh, you know the visual narratives of art and marginalia. And at least in the 19th century, we uh, you know I, it's not just an artistic trope. There are traces of this. Um, unique, uh, spontaneous, and symbiotic relationship between dogs and blind people um, scattered across newspapers. Um, you find them in Australia, in the UK, in the US, uh, even in India, I found some examples of this. Um, and they typically tend to follow the same kind of, um, 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 you know, there's a, a sameness to the narratives of how it's usually a dog that has trained itself or worked with the blind um, its blind owner to um, um, 
to to help the uh, blind ha um, owner to navigate public spaces. So people in the immediate environment, um, you know, often marvel at the ability of this faithful dog. Um, and you see this in both cities and in um, uh, and in more rural spaces. Um, in, and um, you know, newspapers are a fascinating um, uh, archive to explore this relationship through. You also find uh, obituaries of, um, of, uh, of of blind uh, of, of blind people's dog guides in the 19th century. So, this is a, an obituary that was written for a dog a guide by the name of Bob in uh, Chicago, and uh, for 14 years he had guided his um, owner um, August Grau, who was a cigar merchant. And uh, when he died, uh, the Chicago Tribune actually published a, a small article um, titled, This is the Obituary of Bob. Um, it's, um, there's something extremely poignant and uh, touching about these stories, but it is worth noting also that these, um, 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 it's not just um, a feel good story. There are many examples of uh, the blind person's gu dog guide, uh, which, by the way, is different from trained guide dogs, which I'll talk about later. Um, a dog guide in the 19th and early 20th centuries as part of the discussions of the disability con. Doran Dorfman talks about this, um, and he uh, describes the dis uh, the fear of the disability coin as this almost um, um, uh, omnipresent anxiety that someone who is um, uh, performing disability or presenting disability in public is actually manipulating or lying, uh, manipulating you or lying. And um, you know there were um, there are many applications of this notion, but certainly in this case, uh, there are newspaper articles that um, you know talk about dogs becoming accomplices in their uh, blind handlers' crimes, um, or um, that um, you know someone was not actually blind but was using the blind, using the dog to perform blindness. Um, so. What I'm trying to get at here is that before the 20th century and before the First World War, at least, this dog guide would have evoked a, a fairly complicated uh, set of emotions from viewers, uh, from uh, people in public. Um, suspicion, anxiety, because, you know, rabies was still an issue, um, and sometimes violent responses. The story I typically try to uh, often tell students and in lectures is that of Abraham uh, Lefschitz, who was an older man who was blind and had been led around by um, his uh, St. Bernard for many years, but some uh, malicious neighbors would report the dog as being vicious, and the dog tended to be vicious when uh, someone attacked um, Lefschitz. Um, and the city authorities of Bridgeport told Abraham that um, his dog would be put down. So he said goodbye to his dog um, and, uh, and killed himself. Um, and uh, the reason I use this story is that it highlights the vulnerability of, uh, you know, blind people's dog guides in public spaces in the 19th um, and the uh, early 20th centuries before the onset of the, you know, maybe you can call it the formal uh, guide dog movement, which actually begins with the First World War. Um, the First World War is of course, as uh, most of this audience probably knows, um, is a transformative moment in global history, multiple nation states and colonies um, and dominions coming together to battle on a multi-fronted multi um, war that would uh, leave millions disabled, including blindness. Um, and um, the world, so First World War is also distinctive in animal history or dog history, at least, because it uh, profoundly transformed the um, um, the, the state's uh, perception of the um, of the cognitive and labor capacities of dogs. Um, this is perhaps one time when dogs, the first time that dogs were concertedly part of the uh, war effort in such a um, diverse range of roles. They served as Red Cross dogs. They dug out dying and dead bodies from battlefields um, and uh, trenches. They they worked as draft animals um, uh, when necessary. They carried medication and supplies. 
And it, it, as there are many um, stories also of dogs providing comfort to um, soldiers in the trenches. Um, but um, uh, this understanding of the um, of the capacities of the dogs eventually begins to be uh, uh, channeled towards um, the needs of the newly war blinded. And uh, the story begins in Germany, where uh, Gerhard um, uh, Stalling was the first to open the very first um, training school for guide dogs in Oldenburg in 1916. Um, and here, Red Cross dogs were trained by veterans and dog trainers um, uh, to um, uh, they were retrained essentially, and they were mostly German shepherds, as you can see from uh, the um, photograph in the uh, on the slide, um, because German shepherds were considered to be highly intelligent and very well suited to this work, although that changes through the 20th century. Um, and uh, not um, um, the guide dog was presented as quite explicitly as a technological and policy response to the needs of blind veterans, to rehabilitating them into society, to facilitating their mobility by allowing them to move around in public spaces. Um, and um, uh, trained guide dogs became a part of the process of rehabilitation and returning the war blinded to productivity, quote unquote. Um, and um, uh, although it begins in Germany, it um, slowly spreads uh, to uh, Switzerland, the Netherlands, uh, the US, um, Italy, and by the interwar period also reaches the UK. Um, it, the guide dog movement was impelled by uh, um, advocates for the blind, but also uh, dog fanciers and dog breeders and trainers um, and um, uh, and by, uh, uh, you know, some veterans as well. Um, and there was this explosion in uh, the mobility of both dogs and trainers as they moved around the world, um, taking this um, idea of the trained uh, guide dog with them. Um, and uh, it, this was often funded by, um, uh, you know, private charitable organizations um, in some, some parts of the world, also uh, through public funding. Uh, and what began as a uh, measure intended to ameliorate the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the, to, to address the needs of the war blinded veterans eventually begins to uh, become available for civilians, uh, although that is uh, mostly during uh, the Second World War. In the US, the very first uh, trained guide dog was also a German Shepherd um, and uh, was renamed Lux by um, um, his handler, uh, who was a, a senator from Minnesota, uh, Thomas David Shaw. Shaw had been blinded uh, in an in an accident when he tried uh, tried to use a, a lighter, and it exploded in his face, and he was left permanently blind. Um, he had gone around gotten around DC uh, with the help of his wife um, and other human companions, but when the guide dog movement started in Germany. Um, he was presented with a guide dog um, uh, with Lux, essentially. And the two of them actually become very uh, well photographed and interviewed, as you can see here. There's several photographs that you can find of Thom uh, Thomas Shaw and Lux. And when um, in 1933, Lux would die of grief when um, uh, Shaw had to go to a funeral um, and could not take the dog with him. Um, um, the dog refused to eat and just um, died of of uh, of grief apparently. Um, and Shaw would um, in turn grieve Lux's passing in a very public way for the very first time, expressing the unique kind of emotional bonds between dogs, uh, between uh, guide dogs and their blind handlers. This is a you know relationship that is built on a, a lot of trust. Um, and you have to trust the dog and the dog has to trust you to work in this kind of symbiotic way um, to navigate public spaces, traffic, etc. So um, um, service animals in general, you do develop this, uh, it is very often the case that you develop a very strong emotional bond with them. And, um, uh, you know, I 
um, I think Shaw is is expressing this for the very first time in a in a public way. He writes uh, letters that were published in newspapers, several newspapers across the country. Uh, uh, published the story of uh, the noble dog who died of grief. Uh, Shaw himself would receive uh, thousands of letters from people all over the country, and he would he wasn't able to respond to all of them, so he gave a public speech. Um, about his dog uh, uh, in, you know on uh, the Senate floor and um, um, and uh, in the years after um, um, after Lux's passing, several things change uh, uh, in terms of um, access to guide dogs in the u s um, in one thousand nine hundred and twenty nine the seeing eye dog um, uh, Institute is established in New Jersey. Um, and uh, it slowly begins to provide guide dogs for um, vetted um, blind uh, handlers who had to go there and stay uh, to be trained with their animals. But um, the, the 30s also saw growing public advocacy for uh, guide dogs. And this advocacy was necessary because although um, many uh, blind people were uh, receiving guide dogs, they were still confronting discrimination um, when it came to um, getting onto buses and trains. They were refused admission. Um, you know, it wasn't possible even to enter the post office with a guide dog um, until 1937. And um, uh, in 1937, uh, blind advocates, uh, anim uh, dog breeders, and trainers of guide dogs would actually. Um, uh, testify before Congress um, uh, in a hearing that was dedicated to changing, um, you know, uh, to providing legal protections to guide dogs in public spaces. And this always strikes me as kind of uh, 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 Martin Smith would, um, who is a representative from Washington, would describe guide dogs as, uh, in a in a way that I think um, is important. Um, he would say that the um, that people who ran um, uh, trains and trams and buses had to accept that the guy, seeing eye dog or the guide dog was a part of the passenger or blind person, that the dog was the eye of the passenger, essentially. With um, World War II, you see another flood of disabled um, soldiers and veterans, and the need for guide dogs certainly exponentially increases. And the federal government also begins to provide more funding for guide dog organizations. And you see the establishment of the master's eye, um, uh, leader dogs for the blind, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, the movement is slowly expanding, but there's also a growing demand. And um, the guide dog uh, movement also begins to uh, aim for more. Um, you know, um, their explicitly st stated goals have always been uh, to refashion blind people uh, with the help of the dogs and to produce uh, to tr uh, transform previously unproductive blind uh, citizen uh, um, citizen subjects into productive uh, and mobile citizen subjects. Um, um, you know, in 1938, for instance, um, uh, I found some scra uh, scrapbooks in the Perkins Library for the Blind, which says uh, describes the seeing eye as not just a training school for dogs and blind people. It prepares selected blind men and women for a life of personal and economic freedom to which the dog is the key. The dog you're seeing on the slide here is a very famous dog at this time. Um, uh, his Her name was Buddy. Um, it was originally Kiss, but um, um, the her handler Morris Frank refused to uh, describe her as Kiss, um, so he changes her name to Buddy. And Buddy and Frank uh, travel tens of thousands of miles across the U.S. They give newspaper interviews to newspapers. They're photographed, um, you know, um, and Buddy herself is memorialized. As you'll see in the last uh, slide of this um, uh, uh, of this lecture, and uh, Frank describes Buddy in a very um, uh, you know in a way that uh, encapsulates how much guide dogs could do for blind people if that relationship worked. She has signed my Declaration of um, Independence. Um, now, 
at the same time, the uh, guide dog uh, trainers and organizations were, were worried about at this time because um, they not only did they confront legal and policy um, impediments uh, around access to public spaces, they confronted discrimination uh, and public attitudes about dogs um, in public spaces as threats to uh, public health, to order, um, uh, and uh, dogs as unsanitary as well. Um, but uh, another growing kind of kernel of um, um, discomfort at this time, especially in the post-war years, um, was this uh, anxiety that um, uh, this, this relationship between the blind um, handler, especially the male handler, and the dog was one that bred an unhealthy interdependence. And I think uh, no primary source captures this as well as the um, um, U.S. government's uh, pamphlet uh, called the Handbook for the Recently Blinded, which was this um, half comic, half uh, print, small pamphlet that was usually issued um, to people who had to, um, you know, to soldiers to understand how to be around people who have been recently blinded and how, how not to treat them uh, like children um, um, and to acknowledge what they're capable of rather than what they are not capable of. This particular source is, um, uh, demonstrates a real discomfort with guide dogs. On the same time, they acknowledge that the guide dog is a recognized bar, a part of the blind person's equipment. They also worry about, as I said earlier, public dislike of dogs um, and whether the effort of caring for a dog would be too much for um, the blind handlers and or the dogs would be mistreated. Uh, and by this, they do not just, they're not talking about physical abuse. They're, they're worried that people would become too fond of the dogs and treat them softly. Um, and that, that would be bad for both the dog and for the uh, blind handler. There's also a range of kind of spatial anxieties, um, uh, you know, about congested traffic, inaccessible public spaces, all of which are fairly relevant. But the quote that always gets me is, um, there is a further danger that the use of the dog may become an emotional crutch to which the blind person clings as a baby to his rap it, to its rattle. The use of the dog must should not be allowed to prevent the development of independence in traveling alone. Um, so there are, there's this, um, uh, you know, the, there are these tensions, at least in this particular source, between um, what the dog could do to liberate and mobilize blind handlers at the same time uh, a, a very um a, 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 a very uh, interesting anxiety about how it could engender uh, dependence um and i think one of the ways in which uh, they uh, people responded um the um, uh, the state and also um, um advocates for uh, guide dogs and dog trainers would respond was by giving interviews to newspapers and magazines. And one of my favorites is a profile of um, Private Tony Lance uh, in um, Life magazine in August, uh, 25, uh, in August of 1947. He'd been blinded in the Battle of the Bulge and it's a, it's a beautifully photographed and um, very intimate portrait of everyday life uh, showing the um, um, showing how um, Tony had, uh, Lance had relearned how to dress and shave himself and would do, do so in pitch darkness, um, how he had learned to navigate everyday life and, uh, you know, things like waking up in, uh, in on time with braille watches and alarm clocks, how he spent time in rehab, and how the dog, um, Tama, was just one part of the kind of technological um uh, the tools that allowed him to um be rehabilitated into everyday life tama is depicted uh, in the photographs especially as facilitating uh, lance's mobility so you see him navigating crowded streets using public transit um but it's also really interesting how intimate this portrait is you um, you know you see uh, um, not just one of my favorite photographs which is this one here 
um, showing this, you know, moment of um, this bond between um, uh, um, Lance and Tama, but also how uh, uh, Lance was planning on getting married and shows him with his uh, fiance in the park, uh, him at work, um, also, um, you know, learning leather crafts. So essentially, Tama is not just uh, facilitating his mobility, but also his employment, leisure and family life. And uh, I think it's it's a fairly um, um, intentional profile, especially given the fact that uh, at the end of the profile, you have a series of do's and don'ts for people who confront guide dogs in public spaces, including the obvious do not touch them. This is not, of course, the only one um, you find, uh, you know, I collect photographs of, of guide dogs and these are from my collection um, and um, from uh, around the 1940s to the 1970s. Uh, um, and um, they often have a kind of sameness, you know, uh, there is an effort to uh, demonstrate to reinforce how highly trained this dog is and how unique it is compared to other categories of dogs in public spaces, that it would stay in one place if it was allowed, it was told to be there. Um, you also see photographs, for instance, of uh, guide dogs being given to blind uh, workers in munitions factories during the war effort, highlighting you know, the dog's role in these uh, nationalistic, patriotic narratives. Um, and that, um, in um, in post World War Two world, as you know, as many scholars have explored, there was there's this anxiety about the uh, the place according to, to disability and disabled people, not just the disabled veteran, but there's you know also disabilities from polio and other conditions. So um, um, this is a world that is uh, definitely struggling to make sense of how to how to manage and respond to disability. And the, the guide dog is a significant kind of motive in um, the visual and magazine and newspaper representations of blindness. Um, one particular trope of uh, the guide dogs in newspapers and memoirs and magazines is the guide dog as this kind of hero. And one of my favorite stories is that of Almo, who is the guide dog of um, Dr. W. A. Christensen, who saves uh, Christensen and his wife from a fire in a um, in a motel and um, uh, you know the dog is eventually awarded the humane medal of valor and this is just an extreme example but actually there are several examples of dogs um, you know working to save their blind uh, handlers from accidents and uh, you know or, and worse um, um, uh, another kind of really interesting source that I am um, not really unpacking too much here are memoirs, uh, mostly because I'm still reading through them right now. Um, and there are a range of memoirs that come out from the 1930s onwards. Uh, Morris Frank writes one, um, and um, several other uh, blind handlers um, like um, Robert Folk, who was blinded in the, um, in, um, the Pacific Theater. Um, and would be given a guide dog through the Leader Dogs Organization of California. Um, he writes this uh, quite uh, quite a beautiful uh, you know um, autobiography of um, of his journey to disability rehabilitation and his meeting his guide dog Blondie. Um, and um, um, like Morris Frank and others, uh, Frankus. Um, almost kind of shocked in the way he talks about the capacity of the dog to transform his life. If there is any magic in the fine work which these dogs are doing, it is not of the voodoo type, but rather hard work, miles of walking, patience, and the willingness to learn. Um, um, now, if you've noticed, most of the histories that I've told so far are very, very white. Um, and that is kind of a, a, a overarching criticism that you can make of most of disability history. But um, this is drawing on some of the work that I've been doing of late, um, which draws on um, uh, black uh, uh, guide dog team, uh, black uh, guide dog handlers, um, who are 
for obvious reasons, largely ex uh, excluded from mainstream narratives of uh, which are, you know, these kind of celebratory narratives of guide dog histories. Um, and I, you know, one of my favorites was the story of um, Herbert Douglas, who was probably one in the first batch of um, um, of blind um, candidates for guide dogs at the um, uh, seeing eye in New Jersey. And over the course of his life, uh, Douglas would have six dogs. Um, and um, in uh, the 70s and 60s, he was uh, profiled extensively by various uh, black, uh, you know, African American um, um, magazines and newspapers. And um, it, the, the profiles are really fascinating. Um, they describe how he had been taught in 1920 or 30 um, uh, how to work with guide dogs and over the course of his life he would return several times back to the seeing eye for various guide dogs. The photograph that you're seeing here is of Douglas with one of his uh, um, uh, cohort mates um, and both their guide dogs. Um, and he was, um, uh, the uh, Ebony magazine uh, profile described him as the first black man, but also only the fourth person to own one of these canines. Um, you know, and the, the magazine, uh, of course, describes him as a success and he was, he managed to run a successful business. He was very, uh, well known in Pittsburgh, but the, you know, the two of the, the, um, Douglas and his dogs were very, uh, a well known kind of figure in Pittsburgh. And um, like Life magazine, Ebony and um, Jet produced some wonderful photographs of um, of Douglas and his dogs. Um, the one on the uh, left is one of my favorites. Um, uh, yeah, um, it, they're quite beautiful. And um, I think it's important to um, um, you know um, situate the experiences of uh, black. Um, um, handlers of guide dogs into this history and address what Chris Bell has said about the overwhelming whiteness of disability studies and disability history in general. Um, um, it's interesting. I've been looking through various, uh, um, you know, archives on animal history, and it's very difficult to find stuff on the, um, experiences of, um, um, uh, black handlers in general. Um, now, uh, another, um, 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 often described and often profiled figure was Geraldine Lawhorn, who was deaf blind and uh, she was an actress, a pianist and an instructor. And she had a, a, a very beautiful guide dog, uh, Blondie. And, you know, uh, like uh, Douglas, unlike Douglas, however, Lawhorn was uh, profiled in mainstream uh, newspapers and um, which was profiled more extensively in um, in African American newspapers and magazines, as was her connection to Blondie. Um, and um, when Blondie died, she grieved a great deal in the same way that um, um, uh, Thomas Shaw would for Lux. And these newspapers cap allow us to kind of capture um, some of the uh, relationship between uh, um, Lawhorn and Blondie. Um, they were never far, far apart, apparently. And, um, yeah, um, I'm not sure if you can see the, uh, her face, but, um, she would go on to become an instructor, um, uh, at, uh, uh, um, a deaf blind school. And, uh, she would also write a book about her experiences, which I have just now ordered and, um, it's taking about a month to get to me. Um, so. Um, in addition to uh, depicting the experiences of um, uh, of black guide dog uh, uh, handlers of guide dogs, um, I think newspapers like uh, uh, mag magazines like Ebony and Jet um, also um, perform the uh, a very uh, interesting um, uh, the necessary task of. Um, calling for volunteers to train pups, for instance, until they were old enough to go for training at guide dog organizations. 
and uh, you know they they are doing the work of, of framing um, um, guide dogs as a um, uh, as as this kind of sentient prosthetic uh, and a suitable technology for the rehabilitation of blind people into everyday society, facilitating their mobility and economic prosperity. But it is also uh, true that uh, these newspapers and magazines, like others, framed um, uh, uh, guide dog teams in general as kind of a, a, a subject of, of, of philanthrop philanthropy in general. So you see calls for um, you know, to raise funds for um, young black children who wanted uh, guide, uh, blind black children who wanted guide dogs and couldn't afford them. Um, so these um, this media is also being used to raise funds for uh, to, to access guide dogs. Um, and this is um, um, uh, unlike uh, other uh, media, um, black newspapers and magazines also address the, uh, um, the complicated uh, uh, experiences of uh, uh, black blind handlers of guide dogs. Uh, there are accounts of racism and, um, uh, and ableism in public transit, uh, people, uh, people being denied uh, entry to buses um, and um, suing bus companies, uh, advocating for themselves um, and fighting for their rights. Um, at the same time, um, you know, this is one of my favorite photographs, it's from Ebony. Um, and it uh, shows, um, you know, a uh, um, guide dog team right at the heart of the March on Washington. Um, and um, I think it's a very striking photograph. I'm still searching for the um, for who this is. Uh, all I know is that he is carrying a suitcase. Um, I still haven't been able to identify who this is. Um, now, I've talked a lot about the human uh, part of the dyad of, uh, you know, um, uh, dyad and exactly what they experience. I'd like to also take a moment to talk about what guide dog, working as a guide dog would have meant for dogs themselves. Uh, one of the tragic things about um, working as a guide dog is that for some, for many dogs, it was very stressful. Um, you know, early accounts of this work talked about how dogs could only last about four years before they burnt out completely and they would become completely useless other as guide dogs. So they would have to retire. Um, and in other cases, they would become traumatized by traffic accidents, uh, for instance, and would be absolutely unable to work. Um, there are several accounts of, um, you know, disability and death, uh, usually car accidents. Um, so um, I just want to kind of complicate this relationship and, um, you know, situate the animals experiences also here in the story. Um, I'm uh, running out of time, so I'm going to uh, move on to um, uh, uh, a discussion of uh, some of my collections. So in addition to archival work, this um, lecture is based on my collection of um, um, of disability objects. So I collect seals and stamps. Yes, I'm a terrible nerd. Um, and um, a steel is basically a stamp that doesn't have any kind of postal value. So you can't use it as a stamp, but it's, it has the same kind of shape and structure in general. And uh, seals and stamps have been studied extensively by geographers as material and visual culture, less so by, um, uh, you know, uh, disability historians. And that's kind of what I want to do here. Um, disability has always been kind of a um, um, very common uh, motive in um, stamps, uh, you know, the um, through the uh, through the decades, the U.S. alone has issued many stamps which feature um, um, disability um, as a subject. Um, but um, uh, the, maybe the very first representation of guide dogs on stamps was um, in the Saar Republic in uh, 1927, uh, which featured one of the uh, first kind of generation of guide dogs, probably a World War One veteran. Uh, you see other representations also in Italy, and um, um, with the arrival of um, disability and health seals, you know I I'm sure you're all familiar with Easter seals, for instance, which were, uh, you know, start in um, um, 1934. Um, 
Christmas seals are even older than that. Um, they start in the first in the first decade of the nineteenth of the twentieth century, um, oh, and they raise funds for the Christmas seals raise funds for tuberculosis and allied causes, Easter seals for children, uh, for disabled children, and eventually, uh, uh, you know, the seal itself would give the name to the Easter seals, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Millions of seals circulated across. Uh, across the US and the world in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, especially. And they're, they're really interesting sites to explore representations of disability. Um, for instance, if you look at uh, seals issued for disabled veterans, um, you can see, you know, this hyper masculine uh, rehabilitated figure, uh, the privileging of self-reliance and, and um, patriotism and nationalism uh, and a significant dialing back of the disabled uh, subject as a um, um, as a dependent uh, um, uh, object of charity. And you, um, uh, there are so many organizations which begin to issue seals for various causes. Um, these are just a few from my collection. Um, the San Francisco Center for the Blind um, and the Illinois Industries for the Blind. These were essentially used as kind of marketing tools, but also to raise funds. So you'd send seals in an envelope to um, into a house, uh, in, in, into a household, and they would um, um, so th they'd send for it. So they'd uh, um, uh, pay you money and you'd give them the seals and they would uh, use them like uh, decorative stamps on packages and letters, essentially. Um, and in doing so, they were also sending out these miniature messages about disability. Um, and certainly, you know, there are um, uh, certain symbols that appear across these um, seals in the 40s and 50s in the US. Um, um, you know, certain signifiers of blindness, the white cane, uh, dark glasses are very common in um, at least um, all the seals that I could find, and these are just a representative sample. Um, but you also begin to see by the 1940s the guide dog becoming a part of these signifiers of um, of blindness. So, for example, the um, blurry photograph of the Lions Club seal on, of a blind aid uh, features a, a guide dog team and, uh, you know, Bl Blind Service Association for you know, Chicago also features a man uh, holding on to the harness of guide dog and um, a white cane. Uh, it's interesting also how often the guide dogs in these seals are represented, uh, uh, the guide dog teams are represented outside in public spaces, you know, with cars, uh, um, you know, uh, doing things essentially, be, be rehabilitated as being part of everyday life, right? Um, this is from a series I find especially interesting because of the um, uh, title, Be Thankful You Can See. So, yeah. Um, I think I might stop here because it's already 457 and if you want um, in the comments, I can discuss uh, in the question um, time, I can discuss, uh, you know, comics uh, in general. Um, so. Should I stop here? Uh, I, you can, I it's up to you. We, you, you can I think you have like 3 or 4 more slides left. So, yeah, yeah. So um, one of the, um, the last set of media that I wanted to just explore was uh, comics. So uh, comics are really important in, um, uh, from the late 30s onwards. Um, you know, typically, this is known as the golden age of comics. And um, in the golden age and silver age of comics, comics were really important as a part of both children's literature, uh, of children's literature, but also, um, as comic historians have demonstrated, um, you know, the US government used comics to educate uh, soldiers on a broad range of subjects, uh, religious organizations um, like Oral Roberts Uni um, um, University would publish uh, comics on what it meant to be a good Christian, uh, uh, in addition to, you know, kind of superhero comics and adventure comics and horror comics and other um, other. Uh, uh, genres, romance comics, etc. Um, uh, millions of comics were circulating across um, across the population, and they are they are a significant and useful site, productive site for us to explore on representations of disability. Um, 
um, and how um, uh, comics were used quite intentionally to um, educate uh, young children on the possibilities of guide dogs. I will just use one example here. The images that you're seeing here are from uh, Superboy, um, which featured, um, um, you know, um, uh, Crypto the Superdog. Um, in, this, in a couple of examples of, um, um, a couple of storylines, um, Superboy manages to um, um, become blind through accident or injury. And um, uh, in both these instances, uh, Crypto the Superdog, who has superpowers of his own, uh, serves as his super and um, his uh, animal um, uh, companion, but also as his guide dog. Um, and you, you can tell because of the stiff harness in both these uh, representations. Uh, but it's not just in superhero comics. You see uh, uh, kind of uh, stories of um, the Seeing Eye organization being published in adventure and horror comics. Um, you see the Seeing Eye organization uh, themselves worked with comics um, um, uh, writers to produce a short comic on uh, what uh, seeing eye dogs did and how they were trained and how uh, children should not approach them or touch them uh, while they were working and how to give them a, a wide berth when you saw them in public spaces. They also become a part of kind of, uh, you know, you see them in uh, fictional comics as well. Uh, one, this is one example from uh, Mysterious Stories, which is this um, um, adventure comic series. And um, the reason I use this is because um, it's written from the dog's perspective, which is quite unusual. And um, the dog's name is Satin, and she is, um, um, you know, the she's given a, um, a when she actually meets uh, her um, potential handler, Beth. She doesn't; they don't actually get along. Beth doesn't like her, um, and they don't really have a good relationship until. Um, um, Sa uh, Satin saves uh, Beth's life from an oncoming car. The story is um, somewhat sad. Um, uh, Beth gets married and goes off to Egypt with her archaeologist husband and leaves Satin with uh, her trainer. Satin goes eventually blind. Um, and the story ends with uh, a mysterious hand saving Satin from an oncoming uh train uh, oncoming car and the mystery we are supposed to imagine is um this um uh, um uh, <clears throat> the mystery we are supposed to imagine is whether beth had traveled in spirit form from egypt to save her uh beloved uh, uh seeing eye dog um, but it's true, um, unquestionably comics are uh, reinforcing this uh, this notion of uh, the guide dog as a very distinct category of dog, uh, one that is highly trained and highly skilled, uh, but also underscores these uh, emotional bonds between dogs and their handlers. I'd like to end with a few uh, preliminary conclusions for this uh, for this paper and. Um, you know, guide dogs certainly co constitute a very unique category of an already um, unique and complicated interspecies rela relationship between dogs and humans. Um, what I've tried to do with this lecture is to explore the ways in which gu guide dogs and blind human beings were anchored together in this kind of um, um, uh, in this narrative that you see not just in uh, books and films, which Neil Pemberton has studied and others, um, uh, Susan McHugh also has explored um, um, the um, guide dog in um, post-war, World War II detective novels. I was interested in, you know, the kind of everyday ephemera, uh, the things that we um, don't necessarily um, um, explore, uh, look, uh, as sources, so which is why I started collecting uh, stamps and seals um, to explore uh, to, uh, to think about what kind of narratives they tell us about disability and animality, um, and how they were used to kind of uh, um, ascribe new meanings to both conditions. Um, it's very clear that uh, the newspapers and magazines and uh, photographs 
um, and films and books and seals and comics are being used to assuage public anxieties about dogs in public spaces. However, well trained, um, you know, anxieties about dogs as unsanitary, dangerous, uh, you know, uh, as thre threats essentially, rather than um, um, rather than as a companion or as a guide, um, because it's you know. Um, um, Chris Pearson and others have explored how uh, dogs in the 19th century is, you know, one of the most significant kind of categories um, through which people understood dogs in public spaces was as a stray, right? So the guide dog constitutes a significant challenge to that pre-existing notion of a dog in public spaces. Um, and all of these media essentially share uh, the sense of kind of framing the guide dog as a sentient prosthetic. Uh, and um, it's always clear in the, especially in these post-war narratives, how much these dogs are used to kind of um, uh, uh, depict the blind person becoming a super crip. You know, there's, uh, they are uh, immobilized and, um, uh, and unproductive. And with the guide dog, they become productive and mobile uh, and ideal citizen subjects. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, you, the, very often you also see examples of how fast blind people walk with, uh, with guide dogs. And um, it's very clear that, um, um, uh, you know, these representations are trying to frame guide dogs as allowing blind people to uh, 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 proximity to ableness or sight sightedness as much as possible. But most importantly, I think what these uh, different media do is to map the dog very firmly onto public imaginations of blindness. Unquestionably, they were all good dogs. So I'm going to end here and see if you have any questions. All right, thank you so much, Aparna. Um, my name is Courtney Hobson and I'm program coordinator for the Dresser Center for Humanities. Um, and I'm going to be fielding the Q&A um today so if you have any questions please put them in the chat box or in the q a box um and then i will read them um i'll start off with uh, uh, a question um one thing i noticed in a lot of the images is that the majority of the dogs were german shepherds with a few exceptions like i think i there was an article of mention of a collie and then there was a boxer dog um is there any particular i guess they guide dogs tend to be like working uh, type dogs. Is there any particular reason why German Shepherds in particular? So there's a long history to why the German Shepherd becomes the kind of um, uber mensch of dogs in the uh, in the first half of the 19th century. Um, and um, uh, uh, the scholarship, for instance, was that explores how the uh, German Shepherd becomes kind of a, a symbol of German culture and is exported to places like J Japan, where it becomes implicated in Japanese imperial violence uh, and policing efforts. Um, so the dog um, is not some uh, uh, this the breed is not something that we can talk about without kind of talking about those broader histories. Um, at the same time that you see. Uh, this happening, um, dog bre breeders and fanciers are re really kind of obsessed with the German Shepherd as um, uh, this, there's this, um, um, you know, uh, there's an active movement of puppies and uh, adult dogs all over the world as people are trying to establish breed stock in different countries. Um, because this is a highly intelligent dog and everyone, um, you know, especially as the uh, German Shepherd's role in policing and military grows, uh, there's this um, growing interest in breeding German Shepherds. Uh, unquestionably, they're highly intelligent animals, but they, uh, some gu uh, guide dog trainers actually believe that they were not very well suited to being um, uh, guide, uh, 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 gu guide dogs, especially because they were too aggressive. Um, especially the repurposed war dogs, they were not ideally suited for this. Um, typically what we, they were looking for was a dog that had a certain height because it was better to have, um, you know, a sturdy dog in case, um, you know, small dogs would not work or medium dogs would not work for this. So it had to be a German Shepherd. Uh, later it would include 
um, Labradors. Uh, um, the UK, for instance, has a long history of uh, training uh, Labradors. In the US, however, um, uh, they moved on from German Shepherds and began to train Collies um, and also Boxers. Michigan, for instance, had a leader dog school and they would uh, they tra preferred um, boxes and collies, um, but um, initially the reason that uh, German Shepherds were chosen is partly because they were, you know, the dog of the moment, and they had demonstrated their capacities during the first First World War, so they had been repurposed. Um, so that was the um, dog of choice, but um, there were concerns about uh, breed temperament as well. So in Australia, for instance, um, the uh, when the uh, German Shepherd was imported into Australia, there was significant anxiety amongst um, uh, farmers because they saw the um, imported German breed as a threat to their uh, sheep and farms and their settler colonial enterprise in um, in Australia. Um, I, I've rambled on, I think. Yeah, I think. A lot in, in like the emoji pack that you mentioned, like, I think all of those dogs are, are uh, golden retrievers or Labrador retrievers, which yes. is, uh, if you didn't know, UMBC's uh, uh, mascot is a retriever. We're, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're the Chesapeake Bay retrievers. So oh. it's kind of a match made in heaven. Um, <laughs> so the next question is from Dawn Beeler. Um, she says, thank you for this fascinating talk. I'm interested in learning more about this discomfort with interdependence. Do you see any movement in disability communities to embrace or destigmatize interdependence in these more than human relationships? And then she expanded by saying, I'm thinking of the scholarship of Sunara Taylor, who writes about inter interdependence, animals, and disability liberation. Absolutely. So Nora Taylor's work is, um, you know, one of my favorites because she, uh, yeah. Um, uh, historically, the relationship between anim uh, you know, uh, animal studies and disability studies has been a bit contentious because, uh, you know, especially uh, early cohorts of disability advocates and disability studies writers have often had animality ascribed to them, um, uh, you know, being less than human or closer to animals. So uh, there was a um, I guess a hesitancy to critically engage with a lot of uh, animal study scholarship, but in the last maybe especially uh, five to ten years, there's been an explosion of work. Not just Sonora Taylor, but there's a uh, there are some edited collections. Um, um, Sonora Taylor's work on crip animals, for instance, is fascinating uh, and asks us to think about um, what it means to think. Uh, um, what kind of meanings do we ascribe to disabled dogs and uh, disabled animals in public spaces and what do we make of them? Um, but um, I think the most interesting thing that's coming out of this very necessary conversation between these two fields is this destigmatization of um, interdependence. Um, and um, Interspecies interdependence is not a sign of weakness, especially is is the thing that um, many scholars, advocates, and guide dog and service uh, animal uh, uh, handlers in academia and outside academia are reinforcing um, that it's not something to fear, um, and that our fear of interspecies interdependence is just another flavor of uh, our fear of inter interdependence in general. It is, after all, part of the human condition. None of us can escape our need for connection and dependence on other people, um, even if, um, you know, neoliberalism and <laughs> capitalism um, try to convince us that it is possible to live life entirely as an individual. Um, and, you know, I'm South Asian. Our cultures do not pri prioritize individualism at all. We are collect we are social beings with, you know, the, there's nothing to be ashamed of at all in that need for um, connection, comfort, assistance. And uh, I think the scholarship that at that intersection between critical animal studies and disability studies is deconstructing a lot of that discomfort and asking both fields to talk to each other um, in, in a way that is productive and that produces more critical scholarship 
on the experiences and histories and futures of this relationship between disability and animality. Um, are there any other questions before I have before I launch into more questions that I have? Because I just found this so so interesting. Um, Tanya, uh, Tanya, you can go ahead. Um, I mean, I have like so many thoughts. Like one, like the um, the comics at, at the end, and like the very explicit like Superboy, which is like yeah. this uh, visual representation of like this figure in disability that is super creep that is like very <laughs> contested too. Like I I wanted to hear a little bit more about that, but I was also like interested because like. Um, like you collect so many artifacts and images like related to disability if like blindness is like a very high, hyper visible uh disability or like if there's like any other comparison cuz like all the, the the images and also the fact that they have like so many guide dogs and i didn't know what you mentioned at first that like only two percent of people in the yes. U.S. Is it? Yes, yeah, yeah, like guide dogs. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think the disproportion, the disconnect between the actual numbers of guide dogs and the uh, you know proliferation of the cultural representations of disability of the guide dog are exactly what I was trying to get at here. Um, and, you know, that's why I started, although this is a 20th century paper, I started off with the emoji pack because I wanted to kind of reinforce how universalized it has become um, in a way as a cultural symbol and signifier of a blindness. This, I'll start with your second question about um, blindness being overrepresented, and that's actually something that disability studies scholars have picked up on, right? They've, um, um, several scholars have pointed out how blindness and other cat certain other categories of disability, uh, like deafness, um, and certain categories of physical disability are overrepresented in um, especially visual uh, narratives of disability. Paradoxically enough, right, blindness is overrepresented in visual narratives of blindness. And that's partly, um, um, uh, I, some scholars argue that this is partly because uh, these are perceived as redeemable disabilities, right? Uh, and they are e um, um, easily legible in our, uh, in the audience's mind as well, compared to the more complex narratives of something mm -hmm. like uh, so many chronic illnesses, for instance, which are nonetheless disabling, but may not be so easily legible in, a, uh, in these kinds of, um, the, the perfect example are those seals, for instance, they're small, but, you know, they're quite punchy uh, in the messages that they send. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's relatively easy to, uh, to, um, to, to give the message of blindness to, to the audience as well. Either it's uh, dark glasses or a guide dog or a, or a cane. And, um, but the rest requires more work. And it's, a, it's something that I think persists to this day. We still have a tendency to privilege certain categories of disability in uh, the cultural um, representations and narratives of disability. Um, and I think it does some level of disservice to people who live with those less represented conditions, certainly. Um, as for the super dog, yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's so much fabulous work from comic study scholars on um, exactly this. Disability study scholars um, uh, crippling basically comic studies and uh, exploring um, you know, uh, how, for instance, every single superhero um, was disabled before they, be, you know, they, their alt, uh, um, um, alt ego is always disabled, whether it's, um, uh, let's see, Captain America, for instance, his, um, his, um, you know, him, what's it? Steve Smith is uh, weak, infirm and disabled. Uh, physically uh, quite um, infirm. And then he takes the super serum and he becomes this uber mensch of a, uh, you know, uh, this hyper able body. So um, many scholars have explored how superhero comics, especially feature the erasure of disability in order to rep to show this uh, transformation of the um, human or 
disabled human into this superhero figure. It's a very common trope. You'll see this in, uh, in fact, I use it to teach uh, uh, in class because it's so so easy to pick out. The, you know, through either through magic or science or technology, they're able to transform their bodies from these previously weak or uh, disabled bodies into hyper able bodies. Um, super grips, essentially, absolutely. Um, if there are no other questions, I'll do the, the last question, but I also had a follow up comment comments to your talk about um, comic book characters. And I'm thinking of uh, Barbara Gordon um, as Batgirl, yeah. um, who very famously um, uh, it has to use a wheelchair after losing uh, the use of her legs due to due to violence, um, but she's still uh, still a pretty prominent part of the the superhero team that she's in. She yeah. becomes known as Oracle, and she kind of was the person disseminating information. But then a couple years ago, you know, Barbara Gordon recovers and yeah. is now back to being a, a superhero. And so there was some there was a lot of criticism about yeah. that because she was kind of the first prominent superhero figure who was. Yeah. Uh, who was depicted as physically disabled and, and using a wheelchair. Um, but my question um, is, in, I know that you said that your research kind of got started when you, uh, when you started working, uh, when you had your service animal. Um, are you going to, is there, do you have any interest in expanding to, out, to other types of service animals? Like not just the guide dogs, but also just to medical emergency dogs or human yeah. dogs? Yeah, I have a, a, a kernel of a paper that I'm writing right now on um, um, on the, the same way that I had talked about untrained dog guides. Um, I found a lot of evidence of people, deaf people, actually working with their dogs to um, to essentially this kind, of, the same kind of uh, symbiotic, spontaneous relationship, which worked for both. Um, and it's usually small dogs that would alert their or, um, uh, their humans when you know the bell had rung, um, or um, essentially functioning as service animals. But this is before the um, uh, hearing dog movement, which only starts in the um, 60s and 70s. It's quite late compared to the guide dog movement. It's relatively late, and uh, other service animals even take. Um, even longer, I think. Even, and this is actually a mo this is actually what I'm trying to do with the paper, and that's to show how disabled people had, you know, had um, used and rep and purposed animals in their lives into these uh, prosthetics, but they weren't recognized as as such by um, either their physicians or people who people in wider society until the guide dog movement until you know the sanction of um, of the uh, of the official guide dog movement um and um, why i wrote it was because i've been reading up on uh, seizure alert dogs and for many decades patients would tell neurologists about their dogs alerting them to seizures and they would just dismiss it um, which, you know, it just ha goes back to a signal at the general, um, yeah, the relationship between disabled people and their uh, physicians, which is, you know, fairly typical. Um, but um, in the 1980s, for instance, um, uh, there's Thomas Mazzaro, I think his skin, he, he was talking, he would talk about how his dog would uh, wake him up in the middle of the night because he had nocturnal seizures. He told, talked to the press, he told the uh, Epilepsy Association of America. They all kind of dismissed him and uh, so did the physicians. And, um, you know, it took another decade for people to take seizure alert dogs seriously, right? So the paper is more about how, um, Maybe we need to listen to disabled people a little bit more, um, and how history demonstrates that disabled people have been basically refashioning and uh, working uh, collaboratively with animals in their lives to make the most of their lives, really. And this predates the dog guide dog movement. Um, and yeah. 
All right, if there are no additional questions, I'd like to thank Aparna for joining us this afternoon for a lovely talk. And uh, if no one has else has anything to say, I think I'll cut the recording here. Everyone's giving claps in the chat. Um, yeah, so thank you again very much, Aparna, and say hello to your pup. I saw, I saw the pup in the corner. There they are. <laughs> Um, it's funny, I actually saw, uh, something on Twitter, someone was posting about, I don't know if the dog was like officially like their guide dog or emotionally support animal, but they were at the airport and someone was like, your dog is too fluffy and cute to be <laughs> a guide dog. And yeah, I, I don't remember the, it was, it was a thread, but I just remember seeing that and like the person just being like, why do you assume that like the dog has a vest on that says, <laughs> It's, that they are working leave him yeah. alone <laughs> it's what i was talking about earlier it's the fear of the disability con right yeah Ron Dorfman's, uh work yeah it's it, it's awful yeah uh, all right i love that charlie is there with you and he's a celebrity <laughs> yeah <laughs> he he's absolutely a celebrity, is a celebrity. <laughs>